In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one who was, who is, and will always be love. Amen. Today we have the gospel passage where Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now at first I thought of all the ways that I've preached on this passage in the past, and I chose to spend a little bit more time reflecting on how I'm feeling called right now to respond to this passage and maybe you'd like to join me in perhaps shedding some of the old ideas about this passage. It's one which is often used in the church and even a term which is used out and about in the secular world too, to talk about people who help others along the way unexpectedly when they come across someone in need, they perform the act of the good Samaritan and do something to help. So letting go of all that we've known about this before, let's just spend a moment thinking about the setup of this passage, exactly where Jesus is, what he is doing in telling this parable, and who he is telling it to. So we know that Jesus was already teaching, and he was teaching in such a way that those around him were recognizing his authority. Now we hear that there is a young lawyer And the lawyer is the one who pipes up and wants to clarify what Jesus has already been teaching about the kingdom of God, asking what exactly it means to work to be in the kingdom of God and what it means to really follow the commandments. Jesus then throws back another question. And we see that the setting that we're in here is one where there is a conversation, a dialogue, And it is one which perhaps the lawyer was instigating, hoping to perhaps trick Jesus or just test the boundaries. We hear that he said he wanted to test Jesus in the passage. It's recorded as that. So he's testing Jesus out, seeing exactly if Jesus is going to talk about something different to the law, something against the teachings of the synagogue, where he'd be caught out as what we'd call a heretic in our English language but also someone who could then be dismissed. So when Jesus responds with another question, we can see that Jesus is coming alongside this man rather than just giving him a straight up answer, which I think many of us probably recognize there could have been some frustration for the young lawyer. Certainly it would be nice if God was a bit more direct sometimes in answering our prayers or what we are asking, but no, questions are often the answer. And dialogue is the way that we grow into and begin to understand a little bit more the revelations of God. So the young lawyer then responds to Jesus' question, which is, well, what does it say in the law? With the first great commandment, and then the extra little bit on the end of you shall love the Lord your God, will your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, that's it. Great. You got it. Are we moving on to the next question now? Are we going to resume the teaching that was before this question? No, the lawyer isn't quite done yet. Oh, I've got a really good curly question for Jesus. Who's my neighbor? Ah, and Jesus, instead of saying, well, everybody is your neighbor, you don't exclude anyone. Love that God has given you to pass along is for everybody. Instead, he tells this parable. And in this parable, we can see there are a couple of things about the love of God, but also the love of neighbor that all those who are living in the law, but all those who also follow Jesus are instructed to live with this love of neighbor as of self. So in the passage, we see that there is a man, he's been struck down by robbers. This was very common in the ancient world on roads between cities, especially on roads where they were quite frequently um, made by pilgrims. They were the ones who were often going with gifts to a different town or perhaps to temple. And this is where these robbers had been laying in wait and they set upon this man, taking everything from him, beating him up and leaving him half dead. The first person who comes along is a priest. This priest says, oh, there's someone over there that looks like they might be dead. Well, I cannot defile myself with the dead without making myself unclean and I won't be able to fulfill my job when I arrive at my destination. I would have to then go through the ritual purification rites, which would take far too long. 
So it's far better for my employment as my role in the community and possibly for the community if I hope that someone else is going to come along. And so the priest skirts around the man and carries on. Next comes a Levite, an, another official in the body of the Jewish faith tradition. This person was someone who was aware of the law and aware of the law to love neighbor. But possibly this was a person who also had a role in what was coming at the next town. You know, they needed to get on their way. They couldn't linger. It was irresponsible of them to tarry. Perhaps also they were very reasonable, very logical, a, a lawyer who saw, oh, maybe the robbers are still lying in wait and anyone who stops to help this man might have the same fate as him, in which case they're not helping themselves or the man. So I'll carry on. That's the logical thing to do. And then the third person comes along and this person is one who would not be expected to help where those other two perhaps were because they were supposed to be living in the law of loving neighbor. This last one is a Samaritan. And in the ancient world, especially in the eyes of the Jews and those to whom Jesus was tearing, telling this parable, this Samaritan man would have been seen as an unclean person, someone who was a heretic and didn't actually believe right in faith. And they lived completely separately to Israel, the Samaritans. So there was definitely animosity between the two. And yet this is the man who sees what has happened goes a bit closer to have a look and then is filled with pity for this poor soul who hasn't done anything wrong, has just been in the wrong place at the wrong time. And this is the one then who picks the man up, tends to the wounds, puts him on his own animal, perhaps a donkey, and takes him to an inn and makes provision for his recovery. So here Jesus is doing a couple of things. He is actually calling out the religious of his day. He is really pointing the finger at those who stay in their head and know the law inside and out, make excuses often because there's always an argument which can be spun with the law. You can look at it from this perspective. You can look at it from that perspective. And sometimes that's all you'll do. You'll just sit there and look at the commandments and not actually live them. So Jesus is calling out possibly even the lawyer who he's in dialogue with, who he's telling this parable as a response to. Don't get stuck in your head. Your heart needs to be engaged in your faith as well. And your heart will move you to do the loving that God asks of you and that you are instructed to do in that law that you might get stuck up in your head. So there's that. And then the other element to this is also that God's love is for and by everybody. Now, this is not a new message, perhaps, to us. The gospel is riddled with these counter-cultural, counter-social commands that Jesus issues to let go of all the differences that we see in one another and to respond to each and every person, no matter who they are, where they come from, what race, ethnicity, sexuality, gender, political persuasion, even their way of dressing whatever it is that could be a barrier for us, we must break it down and respond to every single being, human or animal, that needs our help and needs our love with compassion. So with all of that wrapped up in this parable, I wonder then what it means for us to, to think of the times perhaps when we've been the person that's needed help. Because that's the other part of this passage. This Samaritan person was a surprise to the audience that were listening in that he helped, but also it's probably a surprise in that this, this poor man who'd been beaten didn't have a choice in which one it was that helped him because he probably wouldn't have chosen to receive mercy and grace and pity and love from a Samaritan. He probably would have wanted to receive it from the priest or the Levite. So we look at it from that perspective too, that sometimes in order for God's love to be lived out in the world, when we're the ones who need help, we must be open to receiving it from whomever God sends our way, not to be picky about who it is that we will be vulnerable with and accept that help from. Okay, so we must get out of our heads and 
know the commandments of God, know the scriptures, know the teachings that help to form us as Christians, but we must make sure we don't get stuck in our head and leave everything to theory and academia and scholarship. We must move that into our hearts and be open to when God gifts us with compassion to share with others. And when that compassion moves us to do something, we must give it out willy-nilly, not checking on who it is that is the beneficiary of God's love, not judging that, hmm, no, I'm different to them or they're different to me. I can't possibly love it, it, someone else. I'll go and get someone else to do it. No, we must love everyone as God does and to break down those barriers and allow that love to flow freely. And then if we're the ones that are called to receive love from someone else, we mustn't be picky. And perhaps we can see that God is channeling love through them to us. And not only is that going to benefit us in whatever need they are addressing, but it will benefit them too, because every single person that is involved in a compassion or a, a love action, they are uniting with God. So whomever we're called to be in that story, may we do it not from the head, but from the heart and heart out to everyone also to be humble in receiving love from whomever God sends our way. Amen.